Advanced Management for NetMotion Wireless. Steve, you want to quickly? There you go. <laughs> um, so hopefully, you know, again, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, this is a, a customer webinar. So hopefully at some point in our careers here that um, um, most of you or, or all of you have met, have met myself or Steve or maybe both of us. Um, today we're really excited to talk about some new product releases. I, I will say since I've been here, which has been about five years, I think this is probably the most feature, re feature rich releases that we've, we've had to date. So really excited to get going. What we'll do is I'll go through the features and um, then we'll leave time at the end for Q&A. Um, we originally advertised this as a 30 minute webinar, so we'll try to keep it to that, but Steve and I will both be available for any questions at the end. Now, everybody is on mute. There's a lot of people on the line today. So if you do have a question, please post it to the question control panel on your right. Um, what I'll do is as I'm going, you know, if I can, I'll answer the question right then and there. If not, then we'll definitely go through all the questions at the end. Um, we also do get a copy of all the questions. So in case we're unable to answer your question during the webinar, um, we will follow up with you directly. This webinar is also being recorded. So everyone will receive a copy of the webinar as well as the slide deck. So in case there's folks at your company that were unable to attend or you want to sort of review the things we went through, um, it'll be available to you after the, after the webinar is over. All right, so let's get started. So one of the things that we've done, um, and, and we're talking about sort of both products because they're essentially a suite, is rather than just, you know, hit you with a whole list of here's all the features we've added, we've sort of logically grouped them into functional buckets. So if you think about security, you know, security obviously is, is something that's important to all of us on this, on this phone. And, you know, what are the features that we've added to really enhance the security of our product? Integration, you know, how can I seamlessly integrate with other mobile solutions? Single console, you know, that is really the, the ultimate goal of us as a company is that we are the VPN for, for all of your remote access, not just your purely mobile users, but even your work from home users. And, and I think you'll see in this release that we're moving closer to that. And then data reporting. You know, at the end of the day, the most valuable thing that we gather is data. And how can we get that data to you so you can manipulate the data in the way that you see fit? And I, and I think you'll see some really exciting things that we've added, which I'll go through at the very end to give you that ability. So let's start off with security. So security, we've added several features around this. Um, again, the great thing is we, we, all of your customers, so some of these features are directly from you. Um, some of them, I, I, or hopefully all of them, you'll be really excited about because they may be things that you've wanted for a while. A and that is exactly the very first one. So what we've added is seamless hotspot authentication. So what does this mean? Essentially, if you think about how our, our mobile VPN works today, you know, typically we are the always on VPN, you know, in many environments you may have configured it such that, you know, the user can't even disable the VPN, which is great. I mean, that's a great security feature for us. The problem that we've run into is when a user goes to a public Wi-Fi hotspot or any hotspot that requires the acknowledgement of, you know, a terms and conditions. And if, if for any of you that have come across this, you, you've definitely you've seen it and you've experienced it. There's creative ways to get around that using policy, but a lot of times it, it's a little bit difficult. It's a little bit cumbersome for you know, the, the administrator to, to manage that. We have now added the ability to automatically detect that the user is at a hotspot that's required to accept the captive portal. And we will essentially, if you will, pause the VPN, shoot up a browser, let the user accept the terms and conditions, and then continue on with the VPN. So, Again, for anyone that has experienced this with our products where they've had to disable the VPN or create policy, I think you'll be really excited about this feature. It's, um, we've really tested it across as many hotspots as we could, and, and it's a great feature. works really, really well. One of the, the things that's also nice about it is it, it mitigates what's known as the even, evil twin security risk. So if you think about in a traditional VPN world, a traditional, say, remote access user, they go to say a Starbucks, they know that their sort of traditional way of doing things is they disable the VPN, they connect to the, the hotspot, and they do their personal, you know, personal time there, and then when they're ready to do their work, then they log on the VPN and they do their work. 
you know, there's a there's a, a, a malicious um, uh, malicious um, virus out there known as the evil twin, which is putting up these these access points that are, are fake. You know, it might look like Starbucks with you know maybe a, a small S or or spelled slightly wrong, and the user accepts those, and then everything they do from then on is basically being monitored. Now, again, we can't prevent them from connecting to an evil hotspot. However, because we can have the VPN always on and we can even prevent the user from disabling it, even if they did connect to that hotspot, everything they do is encrypted. So there's no value to you know, that evil twin gathering any, any information because it's, it's unreadable. So again, this is, this is both uh, you know, a security feature be, because of what I just described, but also it's a very, very good user convenience fe feature. You know, essentially, this gives you the ability to keep that VPN always on. The other thing that we've added is um, tighter security during device provisioning. You know, one of the things that we've, we've heard in the past, and, and you guys may have experienced this, is you, know, you, you put this VPN in the user's hands and they love it, which is great, but they like it so much that they take the software home and they put it on their home PC or they put it on other devices that they want to connect that are maybe not corporate assets. We've added some abilities where you, a user cannot provision an additional device themselves. So again, this is a direct, you know, customer request, and you know, it, it also helps with your licensing, right? Because every time a device connects, that's going to consume a license. Um, we've always been able to do this via NAC, you know, in some creative ways with our network access control. But this is a much easier way for you to basically make sure users can't provision additional devices. Another request that was added, and this was directly from a customer. Um, in fact, it, it was, you know, and towards the end, Steve can speak to this if needed. It was really around the state of California was kind of pushing for this, and that is, if you're going to access, you know, uh, sensitive data that before you are allowed onto the network, you you as an end user need to accept the custom terms of use acknowledgement. So essentially, what this means is, before the VPN connects, it will pop up a message that you can customize that the user has to accept, uh, you know, the the terms of use. So it's another great feature for around compliance. And again, um, really excited to have that. Now, I also wanted to include a few screenshots. You know, th this release just came out, uh, I guess it's been about a month, maybe three weeks. And so you, in case you haven't seen it, I wanted to show you a couple of screenshots. Like I mentioned, some of the tighter security during provisioning, one of the additional things we can do is we can assign settings based on the operating system. So if you think about this, this is really exciting because you know, you may have different settings for your iOS devices as opposed to your Windows devices. And in the past, one of the things that you had to do is, you know, basically move those devices into specific groups. Now you can automatically provision them right out of the gate with those unique settings per OS. We also have the ability to automatically put those devices into groups based by the OS as well. So we're doing a lot around the operating system. Um, again, I, I can see a lot of use cases for this one, and, and I think, you know, as your, your deployment expands, this is really going to help, especially as you at, start to add new devices and new OSs. So really excited for this feature. Um, integration. We now, essentially on iOS, we have added the ability to do a per app VPN. So we now are the vendor that can do a per app VPN on all of the major OSs. Okay, so, you know, if you think about it, what per app VPN means on Windows versus iOS, it may be very different, but conceptually we can do the same thing, you know, so essentially we can tunnel just specific applications. So this is great well, on iOS, it can integrate with your MDM, you can pre-configure our, our, our client and essentially, you know, have it just wrap the specific applications needed for your company for the user to connect. The other feature that we've added which I think everybody on the phone will be really excited about because if any of you have experienced this, I'm sure you've made this request, is we've gone, gone further with our integration with Active Directory. So now what you can do is you can use Active Directory groups as net motion groups. Okay, and I've got a screenshot of that. This I've heard from many customers, you know, since I've been here that have always asked, you know, can't I just manage the, the groups in Active Directory and have it sort of automatically populate your groups? And now we've added that ability. So prior to this release, as you know, what you had to do is as users connected, 
you would move them into specific user groups. And now what you can do is you can define a user group, but point it to an Active Directory group. So you can manage all of that, those users in Active Directory and just know that they'll automatically sync up with groups within the NetMotion product. So this is a, this is a really exciting feature. Um, one of the things that we thought of too, which is great as you can see for resolving conflicts, is what if the user is a member of multiple groups? What you can do is you can actually prioritize these you know, in, in the order that they go. So, so if the user is a member of multiple groups, you know which one it's going to land in. And then again, once you have the group inside of NetMotion, you can use that for policies, you can use that for applying specific settings for users, um, and all of this would be managed in, in Active Directory. So definitely a great feature. It should really, really help with large deployments. Um, we actually had a, a really large deployment just recently beta test this, and it was exactly what they were looking for. So it, it's really helping them out because they, they've got a new group of users coming on, and now they don't have to sort of redefine all of those users within our product. So a single console, again, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, one of the things that, that we're really moving towards, and we've done this for a lot of companies, is to be the de facto VPN for your environment. So we have a lot of customers out there that maybe had multiple VPNs because they might have started with a legacy VPN, um, then they came across NetMotion, they deployed us for a specific, you know, highly mobile group, but quickly realized that, you know, the feature set in our product is so unique and strong that they could replace those other VPNs. One of the things, you know, really, if I went back a year ago, one of the things that held us back was the fact that we didn't support iOS, and, and then the next step was we didn't support per, per app on iOS, now we fully support that. So again, we fully support Windows, Windows Mobile, Android, iOS, and so we really can be sort of a single console for that remote and mobile deployment. Now, along with that, a lot of times what we found is there's customer environments where, you know, as we expand, you know, the breadth of our deployment in that environment, not everybody may need the same type of authentication. You know, there may be a group of users that access highly sensitive data and they need, you know, a two-factor type authentication like an RSA or some token-based authentication, but then there's a different group of users, maybe it's the work from home users, that just need to do a username password. Prior to this release, that always required, you know, multiple pools of our product. Now with this release, we can actually support multiple authentication types per pool. So this is, when you think about how you could use this, there's a lot of ways you could use this. Again, you know, if you think, like I mentioned before, that we can provision devices based on OS, this means I could also provision authentication based on OS. So I could say, okay, Windows devices, they're just going to do a username and password because maybe I've got other security controls on those devices. I'm not as concerned about them being on the network, but maybe my iOS devices, I do have some concerns, so I'm going to force them to use certificates or some other authentication. I can pre-configure that and essentially it will automatically work the, the first time that device connects. So again, this is the ability in a single pool to combine multiple levels of authentication or multiple types of authentication and base that off different device groups. This has been a feature that, again, directly from customer requests, um, especially, uh, you know, with a lot of our public safety customers, you know, they had you know, certain compliance for strong authentication, but it didn't apply to everybody, you know, in their deployment. It just was a subset. They were kind of forced to either force everybody to do strong authentication or go with multiple pools. Now they have the ability to essentially do this within a single pool. So again, great feature. And, and as I mentioned, this is probably our most feature rich release. And the nice part about it is, you know, every feature that we put out is, has been directly from you. You know, so it's been from your feedback, and it, it's really been, um, you know, what our focus on when it, whenever we look at a release on, on different features. Okay, and a question came in here. Um, well, probably it's kind of a long question, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit that at the very end there, if you don't mind. So the, the last section, um, again, we'll, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. The last section is, is one that I personally am, am the most excited about because it sort of opens the door to possibilities, right? It, it's a feature that we put in there and we have some concept of how it would be used, 
but it's really going to be you, the customer, that's going to come up with creative ways of using this, and that's the stuff I'm excited to see. So it's really two big things. You know, like I mentioned in the beginning, you know, data is key, and we collect a lot of data, and we try to present it in a way that, that we feel is helpful, and it is, but it's obviously limited. You know, we, we only can create so many reports um, because they're sort of static, statically created. What we've done is two things. The first one is now we've given access directly to a mobility pool using a RESTful API. So what this means is this, again, was a direct customer request where a lot of customers that had, you know, big data centers and they had, you know, network operations center there, a lot of times they'll have a big screen up that is monitoring all these different systems and they want our system to be on that screen. You know, they have a widget there that is a placeholder for, they want net motion data in there. I want to see who's connected. I want to see the state of the servers. I want to see that they're up. I don't want to have to log on to the mobility console to see that. This will give you the ability to do this. So really excited for folks to implement this feature. And, you know, for everyone on the phone, you know, if, if you do implement this feature, I'd love to get feedback and, and hear how you're using it and, and thoughts on it. Um, th this is one that I think is really going to be useful, essentially, again, to really large deployments. The other feature, which is specific to our diagnostics product, is with our diagnostics product, one of the things we found is, you know, we collect a lot of information about the connection. You know, we know everything about the state of the connection, we know the dr driver the user is connected on, we know what type of device, we, we know, you know what carrier they're connected on, we even know their location information. And, you know, again, going back to reporting, we really displayed a lot of reports, but, you know, the thought really became, why not just take all of that data, export it, you know, directly out through syslog. So when you think about that, if we're sending the data out through syslog, you can use any syslog collector product that you currently have to consume that data and then create all of your own reports. You know, there may be, it may be that, that all the data is there, but there was one report missing that you really needed, or maybe there was only one you wanted to highlight. This will give you the ability to do that. Now, what we've done out of the gate is um, we, we, we looked at Splunk. So Splunk seems to be a very common reporting toolkit in the enterprise. And we talked to a lot of customers, and we, we found out a lot of customers were already running Splunk. And so we essentially are partnering with Splunk. And what we've done is we've created our own app in Splunk. It's available today on Splunk Base. Um, and it's a, it's a way for you to get started. So it's essentially it's, an, it's a sample application that does have um, several reports already in there. Um, it also will help you see how to use the data. You can go in and drill into the data. I've got some screenshots I'll show you. But again, you know, by doing this, the, the sky's the limit. You know, this, this again, the reason why I'm so excited about this particular feature is I really want to hear from you on how you use this. You know, this could be something where, you know, maybe you're a services type company that you could create, or maybe you manage the mobility system for another agency. You could, you know, add value here by providing them custom reports just for them. And since we're exporting it out to something, you know, like Syslog, you can use Splunk or, or whatever your, your toolkit is to automatically create these reports and maybe they automatically get, you know, mailed out to, um, you know, the, the manager of that group, you know, once a week or, or whatever makes sense. So again, this is a really powerful tool. Um, I've got a couple examples here. So, so here's just the first one. You know, basically, this is, these are the ones that come in the sample, um, the sample uh, toolkit that, that we're providing in Splunk Base. Um, so, so these are already created for you. This is just, you know, application usage. So what I can do is I can basically run this report, you know, for a time frame, and I can see usage by device. I can see usage by user. I can see usage by apps. So, you know, what are my top apps that are being used? Who, was the, who, was, who consumed the most bandwidth, you know, last week? Um, it's a nice visual way to see this data. This data is available in the diagnostics product as well, but this is just a different way to view it. And, and again, this gives you the ability to customize it even further in terms of how you want to view that data. Another example, which this is a great one because this is something that, 
actually recently came up as a request from a customer that um, didn't know about this version yet because we hadn't done this webinar. And they asked specifically for this and we already had it. So what's great is we can now, because again, we know GPS data, this is the report to say, show me the last known location, all right? In this case, I'm only showing, you know, 11 devices, but for those 11 devices, show me the last known location and date where they were at. Now, the way that Splunk specifically works with, with location information is it sort of creates these pies um, of different colors, and you can see that I've got two there. What you can do, which, which I haven't done here, but you, you could do it on a sample app, is you can then drill down into those and, and dive in to see exactly the location. You know, this is kind of trying to group them together in the, in the most visual way possible, but you could dive down even further. And if you look on the right here, the great part is I can see, you know, the, the last timestamp where that location information was taken. I see the device name and I see what OS it's running. So, you know, I could even have a report that maybe says, you know, I, I've lost an, an iOS device, or I need to know where all my iOS devices are. I can quickly, with a few clicks, find out that information right here. So a really cool report. Um, again, with diagnostics, if you haven't, you know, seen any of our diagnostics-specific webinars, um, I, I definitely would encourage you to go online and take a look at those. Hopefully everybody has, but, but for those that, that have, you know that we now have the ability to automatically run these end-to-end -end reports to essentially simulate tests along the entire connection path back into the application. So what's great about this, you know, is it's sort of a self-help. It also can be, you know, something for the help desk to get all the data that they need. If the user's having a problem in the field, the help desk will get all of the data that they need to figure out where the problem is and then go fix the problem. So this particular report is showing that. It's showing the last set of diagnostics reports that were run, and it's showing some information about them. You know, wh which ones failed, which ones passed, which ones were warnings. Um, I could obviously click into these and, and get more detailed information, but on the right, I have sort of the top eight, you know, of ones that have failed and what their probable problem or root cause of failure was. This again could be something that is maybe displayed, you know, at a knock. This could be definitely something that maybe a manager would want to see because they want to see, you know, how is the deployment going? I've just started this new mobile rollout. I've got 500 devices. Um, as they're rolling out, which ones are having problems? What are the problems? You know, are there any patterns? This gives me a way because we're sending all of this data to you to really manipulate that data and maybe, you know, stop a problem before it becomes bigger, right? If you see that everybody continually tends to have the same issue, before you roll out all 500, you know, you could fix that problem right away rather than have to deal with it when it's a much bigger problem. So again, this is available today via Splunk Base. Um, in all, everything I went over is in Mobility version 10.7. Um, to get the full features does require an upgrade to 10.7 server as well as the client. Now, for anyone on at least 10.5, the good news is, if you remember when 10.5 came out, you can automatically update the client. So that's very easy to do. Um, you can just push an over-the-air update directly out to your user base. It's very configurable on how that's done. Um, but you will need to upgrade the server as well. Now, the last piece, the Splunk piece that I'm talking about, which is specifically exporting syslog data, that does require Diagnostics 3.10. So um, the nice thing about that as well is over-the-air updates with mobility, you can also push um, the Diagnostics agent out. So even if you don't have Diagnostics today, but you know, seeing these reports at the end it is a compelling reason to get Diagnostics. What's great about Diagnostics is it's available in the cloud. So you've got a couple of quick options to do to, to, to get it. You can come to us, get a cloud instance, and then automatically push out agents to all of your users and do that seamlessly, and then boom, you've got it. And you're, they'll start collecting data as, as soon as they, they connect. So, <clears throat> you know, reach out to us if that's something you're interested in. You know, we'd be more than happy to work with you and, you know, also schedule further demos. So, you know, in the sake of time, I, I, I tried to keep it to 30 minutes, so I might have gone a little quick, but both Steve and I are available for any questions. So again, please use the question control panel um, I, I do know a couple questions came in, so let me try to touch on these um, just really quick here. Uh, 
Um, some of these I, I might have to follow up with you directly because I'm not positive I understand the question, but let, let me go to this one. So multiple authentication on a specific device, device, only one authentication method or the other is permitted, correct? The user couldn't choose. Uh, great question. So, so if I'm reading this right, is um, the user is not given the choice to choose what type of authentication they do. That, that is correct. It is based on the device. So if the user connects, let, let's say you configure it so all iOS devices have to do a strong authentication, um, it doesn't matter who the user is. When they connect from their iPad, they'll have to do strong authentication. Okay. Um, Oh, great question. So where is the location data? So <clears throat> that's a really good question. So specifically with the diagnostics product, again, there is an agent involved, but you can push it out if you have at least version 10.5, so you can automatically push out that agent. Basically, th what that agent does is every five seconds, it takes a snapshot of the connection. And one of the things that it will do is it will actually grab GPS data. Now, obviously, GPS has to be available. Um, if the device has an air card, most air cards support GPS and we can read it directly off the air card. Um, if not, if there's an external GPS, maybe an external antenna, um, we also support that. So, you know, again, every five seconds it takes that snapshot and essentially it's sending that data up to, you know, a, a diagnostic server that could be on premise or in the cloud. And then from there, we're automatically sending that via syslog to your system. And so all of that data stream contains the GPS data, so, so you can actually get down to exactly where that device is. Um, okay, another, uh, David, I, I see your question. I'll probably follow up with you directly since it's a little lengthy, but um, <clears throat> good question. Steve, maybe I'll give you this question. Um, this is a, a very, a very intelligent question, or, or uh, probably a long time net motion customer. But the question is, is there an XE client release of version 10.7? And um, I believe, go ahead. I was just say, a real simple answer, yes. Um, there is, you can find it in the other supported software section of the download portal. Perfect. Um, one thing, um, sorry, I'm, uh, some of these questions are really long. Um, okay, there's another long question here. I'll probably follow up with you directly because it's a little lengthy. Um, great question. So this question came in, where can I get training materials um, or sort of a how-to for Diagnostics 3.10? So I'll answer that in a couple of ways. Um, first off, one thing I, I would definitely encourage you to do if you haven't is to watch um, some of our pre-recorded webinars. We've done a couple of diagnostics webinars. Granted, I, I, I'll be honest, they're, they're fairly high level because they're kind of meant for customers that don't know or prospects that don't know what it is. Um, but it also does dive down into some of the material. The, also, the online help for that product is extremely, extremely good. It's very well written. It goes through and shows you all the different tests that we run uh, as well as you know, what the different results are and potentially what they mean. And, and then the last piece is just reach out to us directly. We can definitely help you. We can do a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, um, WebEx meeting and, and go through the product uh, with you directly. We currently do offer certification training for mobility. Um, we do it once a month throughout the U.S. and we're, we're starting to expand outside of the U.S. Um, however, we currently don't have a diagnostics class, but that is something we are also under development. So hopefully something we'll have later this year. Okay, great. Okay, here's a good question. So Steve, I'll give you this one too. So the question is, um, I, I'm gonna reword the question, but, but if I upgrade my server to 10.7, what is the oldest client version that they will still support? The oldest client version? Wow, this is uh, going back in the Wayback Machine. Um, <laughs> We have, we have tested with the 9.0 clients. Um, wow. So okay. people, well, that's what we've tested with. Uh, so people who've, who are running any of the V9 clients can certainly connect to a 10.7 server. Um, you're not going to get all of the 10.7 features, um, obviously, because 
a lot of the features that we implement require a current client and a current server. But you shouldn't be bashful about planning server upgrades. And I would strongly encourage you to give the support crew a call and open up a support case. And they'll actually help you through the mechanics and help you build a solid plan. Uh, what we found is that by getting the support team in early, um, it just makes the whole process go smoother for everyone. So uh, that's sort of the, the plug that the support crew always wants me to make every time we talk about upgrades. Yeah, that, that's a good point, is um, definitely let them know because, you know, a lot of times they would like to know anyway that, you know, oh, wow, this big customer is planning an upgrade this weekend. So if, if they do get a call because maybe you, ha you ran into a problem or a question that they're not caught off guard, but they'll also validate your upgrade plan. So if you tell them, hey, this is what I'm thinking, that they will come back and make recommendations on the best way to upgrade. Um, so speaking of upgrade, there was a direct question related to that is, um, if I'm on version 9.2 of the server, can I upgrade directly to version 10.7? And I believe the answer is you need to be on 9.5, but Steve, I'll let you take that one. Um, we've tested direct upgrades from 9.2x. Um, it is, it's a little bit tricky, and there's, there's a lot of variables in play, because if you'll recall, uh, we've made substantial changes to the infrastructure of the product, sort of the guts of it, um, since 9.2. Um, again, this would be, you know, this would be a great, great time to call the support yeah. crew and, and help them, or let them help you sort out the mechanics of it. But we have tested the upgrades. Um, you know, what I can't guarantee is that we've tested your exact scenario. Good point. Um, another question that came in, and um, I'm glad this person asked this because I want to make sure I explained it correctly. Can the auth method be by any other group, or is it only OS type? And um, the answer actually is the auth me method is by device group. Now, one of the features we added is you can auto-populate a device group by OS. So, so that, maybe with the way I worded it, it sounded a little confusing, but basically you, you can do it by device group or OS type. And the OS type is specifically because we can auto-populate a device group by OS type. So it, it is by device group, though. Well, and, and just, just to clarify, that also means a group can only have one device in it. So if for some reason you wanted one device on your network to authenticate in a specific way, that's, uh, that's fully supported. So another question. Um, this is a good one. So, so OK, um, I'll probably give this one to you, Steve, uh, but maybe we can both answer it. Essentially, the question is, will there be a diagnostic, diagnostics client for Windows Phone 8 or Windows Phone 10? I believe our position is that we are focusing on Windows Phone 10, specifically on the recommendation from Microsoft. Um, so we, I believe we will have both the mobility and the diagnostics agent for Windows Phone 10. Anything you want That's to add to that, Steve? No, that's 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 right. We're we're involved in Microsoft's uh, VPN developer program and have been getting regular updates on the Windows 10 operating system, uh, and are working with them to port mobility to the Phone 10 platform. Um, when they contacted us to do this, uh, and we started looking at the particulars, what they found is that in order to support us to Phone 8. Uh, they would have to have um, redone parts of the Phone 8 operating system, and by that time, the Phone 10 operating system was was already under development. It just seemed like a, a better idea to put us straight onto Phone 10, um, while you know at the same time they're making plans to upgrade all of the Phone 8 devices to Phone 10. Perfect. So um, here's a good question. So essentially the question is, you know, um, diagnostics, as I mentioned, can be cloud-based, but it can also be on-prem-based. And the question really is, they're, they're specifically asking around sort of what server requirements are there as compared to version 2.0. Um, one thing I think you'll be happy to learn is with the diagnostics product specifically, over the last year, we've drastically improved the performance of the product. So whatever specs you received, you know, back in that version um, will definitely meet your environment. Um, but reach out to us and we can, we can give you specifics. But now 
the diagnostics product can scale to you know thousands and thousands of devices and so it, it we've really enhanced it quite a bit and so the server specs are not nearly as high as they used to be okay um, do, 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 do. oh great question okay so the question is does net motion I'll give this one to Steve does net motion <laughs> plan to directly integrate with an MDM vendor such as AirWatch? Um, we, yeah, we don't want to get in the way of anybody using, a, uh, using an MDM system like uh, AirWatch or MobileIron or frankly any of the other market leaders either. The way in which MDM is implemented on the various platforms differs and you know, we're, in, you know, we're in active discussions with those market leaders now to, uh, you know, to integrate more tightly. So, if you're using one of these products and uh, you want to do us a solid, uh, get a hold of your sales rep and say, hey, we really need you guys to work with NetMotion and implement a tighter integration between NetMotion and your product. Um, that will actually go a long way towards, uh, towards moving those uh, integration plans along. So Perfect. thanks for asking that. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, here's another good question, and and I literally just before this webinar came from a meeting where we talked about this question, so um, I'm going to answer it, answer it in kind of a sensitive way. But the question is, will NetMotion ever support Mac OS X? Um, working with we, what we've learned working with Apple to develop our iOS client is uh, there's a lot of things that we can and can't talk about. Um, but you know, this is definitely something that's on the table that we're researching. Um, what, what I'm not sure right now, and we need to get a good answer to this internally, is is what we can and can't say about it. But just if you read between the lines of what I'm saying, that then that's positive information for your question. Okay. Um, oh. Great question. Is this webinar available for replay? Yes, this webinar has been recorded. Um, again, I mentioned this at the very beginning, but you, you might not have been on at the very start. A uh, couple of things. The webinar is recorded. You will receive a copy of the slide deck as well as a link to the webinar. So in case you missed part of it or there's others that you want them to see, uh, it, it'll be fully available to you. So and that, that will be shortly after this webinar takes place. Okay, that, that seems to be all of the questions right now. Uh, Steve and I, we, we do have time, so feel free to fire away more questions, or um, if not, then this really concludes the webinar. So again, we'll stay on. If, if you have questions, go ahead and use that question control bar, but really appreciate everyone joining today. Um, and again, really excited for this release, um, so hope everybody looks to upgrade. Um, okay, here's a quick question. So. So the question is, and we may need to take this offline, but the question becomes, can we talk about the new certificate feature? What I think this question is asking is the ability to use for the, um, for the console to use sort of maybe an internal PKI. Um, Steve, I don't know, do you want to talk about what we've done there? Okay, so the, um, the certificate feature is really targeted at folks who've implemented PKI on a, on a larger scale within their organization. So there's two basic models. You're either you know, buying certificates for someone, from someone like VeriSign or you've implemented uh, an internal certificate authority. We've, uh, we've made it really, really, really easy to import those certificates into the mobility management UI and integrate the mobility server into the broader corporate you know, PKI initiative. Um, so you can deploy your mobility server the way it's always been done using self-signed certificates. Not a problem, still works great. A lot of people prefer to use that. But you know, if your organization has taken on the discipline of uh, PKI organization-wide, um, then you know we've got native support for that as well now, and it's it's really really simple to do. Perfect. Um, here's a great question that that just came in, and and what I'll do is I'll follow up with you directly on this question, but because ironically, what you're asking for just came out today. So the question is: Is there a document or presentation that outlines the per app capabilities for Android devices? 
Um, it, it is different than iOS devices. So what, what I'll do, like I mentioned, I'll reach out to you directly. I've got some information on what that can and can't do. Um, okay, here's another question. Um, okay, I, I'm not positive I understand this question, but the question is, is there a way to set user auth rather than device auth? Oh, okay, I understand what the question is. So I, I think what they're asking is, you know, um, out of the gate with this release, what, what we're doing is we're saying based on the device, you have to do this particular type of authentication. And I think what this person is asking is, can we do that based off of the user? Um, there's some difficulty in that, you know, because the user itself is, is potentially a part of the, of the authentication process. Um, I don't know if we have plans to do it per user. Uh, right now it is just per device, device group. Yeah, I can, I can jump in um, on, on that a little bit. Uh, it's basically a chicken and egg problem. You have to know which authentication type to use before you can run the authentication sequence that identifies the user. Um, and, uh, you know, we took a look at that. It's certainly not something that we're giving up on. Um, it just seems that we could do a lot of good by tying it to a specific device, um, mostly because we know what the device is very, very early on in that initial negotiation stage with the, uh, with the mobility server. Um, here, here's a great, great question, and, and we can definitely circle back on this one, you know, is in terms of licensing costs. Um, and specifically, is the per app licensing different, um, the, the licensing costs? I, I would say, um, I think that was Dave that asked that. I, I would say reach out to your sales rep on that um, to talk to them about your specific use case. You know, essentially because all of the features are still there, you know, and that's really where the quote unquote cost of the product is. Um, the licensing is really the same, but again, you know, always reach out to your sales rep, you know, anything around licensing or cost questions. They can work directly with you, um, you know, depending on your environment there. Okay. That looks like we've got to every question here. And again, for those it, that I didn't get your question, there's a few questions in here that I'll just follow up with you directly. But uh, again, thanks everybody for joining. Um, we'll go ahead and stay on a few more minutes to see if any more questions come in, but uh, otherwise, um, that's it for today.